Hello, hello, and welcome back to class six of our CRQ. I can't say this in Portuguese today. My tongue is tied. Curso de resolução de questões. Tem dia que eu sou mais gringo que outros. But today, we are taking on the concept of history. And you know, it was something that last year, 2018, I began to realize that I had been skipping the topic of history. I'd given a couple of little things here and there about memory or about a biography or something about a person, but I wasn't talking about world events and then what happened. On the second phase examination of 2018, the composition topic was talk about World War I, its uh, events that led to World War I and why the leaders made these choices. And I was like, hmm, I hadn't taught any of that. Hmm, I'm sure that the history teachers were teaching it, so at least I knew that. I've been teaching the English, so I thought, okay, next year, where we are today, I need to bring in sections of history. I'll be quite honest with you. I like to be honest up front. Uh, I, uh, I do know a lot about history, but World War I is not my bag. I know a lot more about World War II than I know about World War I. Uh, and so when that question came up, World War I, I thought, hmm, I probably would have had a difficult time answering that question because I didn't know the exact events of World War I. Now, you who are studying for the examination, it's a given. You need to know the major international wars, World War I, World War II, right? Even the, the, the smaller wars, like you know, small in quotes, Vietnam War, Korean War, uh, Persian Gulf War, things like this, you, you probably study them left and right. So last year's examination, of course, I'm outside of the CRQ here, I'm kind of in the CRE, but that's all right, uh, showed two things. One, do you have knowledge about World War I? And then second, if you have that knowledge, can you use that knowledge in English? And so the real test was, okay, we expect you all to have knowledge of history. But if you don't know English, you still won't pass the exam. So we kind of put everybody at the same level. Should all have this novel, uh, knowledge of English, of, sorry, should all have this knowledge of history because we expect you to know it. If you don't know that, then you're going to be penalized even, even further. And then, you know, so how well are you able to express yourself in English? And I thought, you know, there's nothing to say they can't bring that back into the CRQ. They did one about Christians and Muslims, like a 16th century Inquisition kind of, of text. They did one about Frederick Douglass and the African-American uh, history, right? So they do throw in some. They did American English versus British English, which is also partially it's a kind of a linguistic history. So you do have history as a main idea. So anyway, babbling on here to tell you that I think it's important for you to read some articles. And in here, I have taken small excerpts from three articles that I think you should absolutely read. Now, I didn't put the, the articles here. Sometimes I like to put the slide with a picture and, the, and the, uh, the website where you can find it. But I did put that information, if you look in your answer key, okay? And you come to the end of each text, you will see the word source. And where the source is, in quotes, is the name of the article. All right, and so if you just put that name of the article into the Google search, you will find where it is, and then you can click on it, and then you know you can see if you can download it. It's Foreign Affairs, Economist, things like this. Then that that's a whole other ball of wax, whether you have to pay or not. Okay, but <clears throat> the first article, when Stalin faced his Hitler, was Foreign Affairs, September 19, 2017. I'm looking over here because uh, I have the the answer key on my computer here. So I have two computers. I have the one that you're uh, uh, seeing uh, in your screen, and then I have one over here that gives me a little bit of a reference. The second article is Warnings from Versailles, which is a great article. Oh, by the way, that first article is like 15 pages long. If you're taking the CRE, I have put it into one of the, the classes. We will not you know, go over everything in it, but I put the whole article there because I felt it was so important for you to read. It gives a really interesting look at what was happening, what was Hitler doing in Europe, and what was Stalin doing. You know, Hitler was much more aggressive. Stalin was respecting the non-aggression uh, pact of 1939, if I'm not mistaken. And 
uh, how Hitler began to take over all of Europe and then turned his armies towards the Soviet Union. And then what was Stalin going to do? It's very interesting. So that's a 15-page historical account of what happened between these two leaders, right? So it's an interesting, interesting. It's from 2017, but it's a history, so it's something that doesn't go away. And it was a well done, as far as I'm concerned, a very, very well done short history of that period. Uh, Warnings from Versailles came out in January this year, and I found it really interesting about this look back to what happened in 1919 with the Treaty of Versailles and what. Uh, what that meant to the end of the First World War, what their intentions were to, you know, in the Woodrow Wilson, the war to end all wars, which was absolutely wrong, the League of Nations that never was assigned by the United States, and, you know, many different things that happened. So this is a nice little reflection upon where 100 years after the Treaty of Versailles, I, I put that in your mind. Now, they just gave World War I last year, so it was in the middle. We're at the Treaty of Versailles, so this idea of, of a treaty, uh, agreements, international agreements can be a very interesting topic for you to be thinking about for 2019, okay? And this article is wonderful. And there's another article that came out at the end of, uh, let's see, when it came out in September 2018 called The Committee to Save the World Order, which came out in Foreign Affairs. It was a commentary about what should be done to counteract the the moves and sharp power by China China and Russia they've kind of set they've kind of set up a, a two sided um, battle going on in the world which actually has been going on for some time now if you read from the Sapienza magazine not the last one but the previous one Ubin Hikuperu when he came last year and gave a talk it was very interesting about that whole uh, 20th century fight from World War II all the way up to today, between communism and capitalism, right? Now, some people call it the authoritarian state versus democratic state, right? But in the 60s and 70s, it was communism versus capitalism. And, and, and I think they're kind of interlinked. So we have democracy and capitalism, authoritarian, authoritarian state and communism. So it's this kind of, of uh, melding of philosophies, and they're still battling each other, right? Let's take a Venezuela as an example right now, where uh, the whole Western world has now gone against Maduro, but Russia and China are still supporting Maduro. So why? What do they have from that? Is it really about the oil? Is it, a, is it a philosophical concept? So there's a lot of these new kind of sides being taken that I think are, are interesting for you to pay attention to, not only in English, but in Portuguese, in international relations, in history, in in economy and many other fields, okay? So it's a very, very interesting moment. So I don't want to talk any more about that because I'll lose time here to go through our questions. But that's the thing. I want you to read those three articles. When, St when Stalin faced Hitler, warnings from Versailles, and the, what was the last one called? The Committee to Save the World Order. Three articles, that's your homework, okay? You've done these little excerpts and, and the questions, and that's what we're going to go over right now. Now go and read each of those three articles, and you'll be very happy that I asked you to. I think it will give you some background, journalistic background information, superficial information, but it might help you to be rethinking what's going on in the world today 100 years later, right? Okay, let's get to work now. History of the World Wars. So I tried to choose these articles, one about World War II, one about World War I, and then uh, another one about where are we today, okay? So the first article, we're talking about uh, Stalin and Hitler. As I said, it's a wonderful article, 15 pages long, but a, a wonderful article, a historical article about uh, what Hitler was doing and what Stalin was doing and how they clashed. All right, so... Um, According to paragraph one of the above text, determine if the following statements are true or false. Now, the first thing to recognize in this in our TPS strategy is, it says, according to paragraph one. I say again, according to paragraph one. Just like we've seen with vocabulary questions where it says this vocabulary term in this paragraph. When we have a question like this, and it's a directly stated or an inference, here we see more directly stated, I believe. Let me just double check my verbs that I put in here. Uh, followed, have been invaded, uh, remained, uh, maintained. So we all have active verbs here, so we know it's a directly stated information question. And we know that it's only linked to paragraph one. And this is very important because sometimes in an article what they'll do is they'll give you background information in one paragraph, and then two or three paragraphs later, they'll contradict that information with new information. 
right? So if it says according to the text, we have to analyze the whole text uh, and, and its uh, contradiction in terms. But when it says paragraph one, we have to exclude the rest of the text and consider only paragraph one. So what was the information given in this paragraph? You see what I'm saying? So be careful about that, because sometimes what they'll do is they'll give a question from a specific paragraph that is different in a different paragraph. So answer the right question, okay? All right. So number one, letter A. Hitler and Bismarck followed a highly similar strategy of German unification in an attempt to maintain an effective balance of power in the region. Well, you see, I, I highlighted follow a highly similar strategy of German, German unification. In fact, it's very clear in the text that it says um, Otto von Bismarck had deliberately avoided forging during the wars of German unification. So if Bismarck avoided doing what uh, Hitler had done, then how could they be similar? Right? And not highly similar, which means very much similar. Okay? So there's no way. So it's very clear in the text that Hitler did one thing and Bismarck did another thing. They just simply, they knew that Bismarck should have done at that time, but he didn't actually do it. So therefore, it's not a similar strategy. Easy enough, right? Letter B. In 1941, countries of Eastern Europe had been invaded by Hitler's troops and had become economically dependent upon Nazi Germany. When we talk about Eastern Europe, we have to think of the countries such as Bulgaria, Croatia, Hungary, and Romania. Okay? And it says here, uh, Hitler's troops had occupied the Balkans, Denmark, and the Low Countries, Norway, and Northern France. So Hitler had invaded those countries. But then it says leaders loyal to the Fuhrer ruled Bulgaria, Croatia, Finland, Hungary, I Italy, Romania, and Spain. So what can we infer from this, or what can we understand, is that Hitler hadn't actually invaded these countries, but the leaders of those countries were loyal to Hitler. So when it says here these countries had been invaded by Hitler's troops, that's what's false. They were economically dependent, and they were loyal to the Fuhrer, but they were not invaded by Hitler, okay? At least not according to this text, okay? So, false. Letter C. Uh, I noticed that I, I gave not enough information be, uh, below here, but I'll, I'll explain what I mean. Sweden and Switzerland, together with the likes of Finland and Spain, though not conquered, remained loyal to Germany politically and economically. And at the bottom, I only put only Sweden and Switzerland remained neutral, and both were cooperating with Nazi Germany economically. When actually I should have added in this sentence above, because when it says here, leaders loyal to the fewer rule Bulgaria, Croatia, Finland, Hungary, Italy, Romania, and Spain, Hitler essentially controlled all of Europe. And then it goes on to say only Sweden and Switzerland remain neutral. So what can we say? We can say that Finland and Spain, which are in this previous sentence, were not actually dominated by Hitler, but they were loyal to Hitler. Okay? And Sweden and Switzerland were still loyal and politically, uh, uh, loyal politically and economically. Okay, so even though they were neutral, now the one question you might, you might uh, take a little bit of issue in the sense of loyal politically. But if you're, if you're loyal to and you're cooperating with Nazi Germany economically, then you're not going in an absolute political, um, what I want to say, you're not in a complete political opposition. How can you be in a political opposition and be uh, an economic partner? It doesn't make sense. Right? So I think that we can ex uh, extract from this text that even though uh, Finland and Spain were loyal, so we can say politically and economically, and Switzerland and Sweden, since they were loyal economically, it goes to reason, it stands to reason that we can assume they were politically loyal, but not taking a side mil militarily. Okay? That's my objective. But if you, if you really took issue with the word politically here, it's a possibility. You might be able to do an appeal saying, well, if they remained neutral, then they wouldn't be politically in favor or against. But my question is, if they're, if they're economically loyal, how can they be politically disloyal? You know what I'm saying? It doesn't seem to make sense. But anyway, so I'm calling it true and take it for what it's worth, all right? Letter D. England maintained a direct opposition to Germany. Their ver their vulnerable military strength on the continent notwithstanding. Now here's a good use of notwithstanding at the end of the sentence. It just means despite. So England maintained a direct opposition to Germany despite their vulnerable military strength. Okay, so you put that notwithstanding at the end of the expression, it's a more formal way of writing despite. Okay, so it's just a contrast. Even though they had 
uh, a weak military strength on the continent. So this is true because it says true. The defiant uh, uh, British still refused to come to terms, but London could never overturn Berlin's continental dominance. So even though they were, they were not coming to terms, they were in opposition to Germany, but they did not have the military strength to, com to combat Germany at that time in, on the continent of Europe. Okay, makes sense. Move on. Whoops, wrong button. This button. Move on. Number two. Now we move to vocabulary. These are the ones that I always love. I know that you're, you're probably going, that's crazy. He takes so many words. Uh, you know, the reason why I do that, actually, um, if you analyze the examinations, go back and look at the last five years of examinations and look at how many vocabulary the questions there were as compared to directly stated and inference questions. Uh, and then look at the directly stated questions and uh, uh, inference questions and see how many of them were based on vocabulary. And it will take you some time, but you get the idea. There's so much basis on vocabulary in English about what do these words mean and what can we understand from this text because of the, 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 the semantic usage, lexical usage. That's why I give so much vocabulary because I think when you know more vocabulary, then uh, you can make sense of almost any text, right? So that's my defense and I'm sticking to it. Move on. <laughs> Number two, so uh, forging and shaping. When we look in the context, Otto von Bismarck had deliberately avoided forging during the wars of German unification. So Bismarck had avoided merging or bringing together, shaping, okay, creating. So yes, shaping is a, a, a correct uh, substitution here. Remember that we, when we use the word replace, we have to think both semantic and grammatical, okay? And here it is, shaping, forging, same grammatical usage. The expression rampage, I should say rampaged, am I right? Yes, okay, it's a typographical error on my part. Uh, this should say here rampaged. I will double check that. Though. I hope that it didn't come out in your materials like that, but it should have been rampaged. The expression rampaged can be replaced by stormed when it says as Hitler rampaged across the rest of Europe, which means to invade violently and aggressively, which is the same word as storm. To storm into or to storm a place, to storm across the rest of Europe means to aggressively attack. So they are the same. Cornucopia is one of my favorite words, right up there with plethora. I almost put the word plethora here, but it's not quite the same. Plethora just means a large amount of. When it says, aided by the cornucopia of Soviet raw materials. And at that time, the idea was they had an excess, a large supply of, which is the word glut. We've seen glut in a previous uh, uh, class, or glut of, meaning excess or surplus, right? So the word cornucopia could be substituted by glut. And it does, it is followed by the preposition of, so uh, the noun form would work, okay? Then when we come to the fourth one, aggrandizement, they shared aggrandizement, oh, sorry, uh, the two geopolitical I ideological rivals as a result of their shared aggrandizement had acquired a common border. So their aggrandizement means their, um, oh, uh, I, just because I'm trying to think of it, I want to say, can't think of a good synonym here because of their uh, empowerment, I guess would be the right word there, empowerment, yeah, because uh, they had become more powerful than uh, uh, the two powers of Hitler and Stalin or Germany and the Soviet Union had become so powerful, now they had to meet at a common border because Hitler had invaded uh, I forget what was the last country he invaded, France, turned his tro troops towards Soviet Union. Now it was a border between Germany, which was Europe, and Soviet Union. So we're talking really more about the idea of empowerment, of larger strength. Amelioration actually means to be better, to improve. There is another definition of aggrandizement which says enhancement. Okay, amelioration, but that's not the usage in this context. It's more in the sense of empowerment, of strengthening. Okay, so you have to be careful. Even though the word amelioration can be used for aggrandizement in a different context, in this one, it's not being used in the same sense. Okay, that's why it is false here. Okay, 
Paragraph three, considering the sentence Stalin's apprenticeship in high stakes diplomacy had shown him to be cunning, but also opportunistic, avaricious, obdurate. The expression cunning, but also opportunistic, avaricious, obdurate could be properly replaced by which of the following. So what are we looking at here? Basically, we have a glorified vocabulary question. They took uh, I took, actually I wrote the thing, <laughs> right? Cunning, opportunistic, avaricious, and obdurate. I could have just given those four words with slashes like I do sometimes, but I usually do that with slashes when it's not together. Here, the four words go together. Those are all uh, adjectives describing Stalin, okay? So what we need to do is to see, what, what I need a, a group of four words that maintains that same kind of meaning to describe Stalin. So we still are going to look vertically Sly, wily, uh, and crafty all have the idea of kind of the malunder idea of taking advantage of the situation, okay? Uh, whereas guileless, um, guile is trickery. So guile would actually, guileful would be the same, right? Full of trickery. But guileless means very honest. So therefore, uh, it's exactly the opposite. The, the suffix here is the problem. Right? Should say guile full, not guile less. Uh, what's the other one? Um, opportunistic, take advantage of the situation uh, for your own gain. So you have unscrupulous, devious, resourceful to an extent because it means that you're using what you have at your disposal to be able to uh, accomplish your goals. But resourceful tends to be a more positive term. That's why I put it in green. Uh, here, the opportunistic was meant to be negative in the sense of a, like a malandro. So you have unscrupulous, devious. Uh, righteous actually means from God, right? Being perfect and doing everything according to, the, to divine regulation, let's say. So no, uh, that's not the sense of opportunistic. Avaricious means to want a lot in excess, to be greedy, to be rapacious, to be covetous, meaning wanting everything for yourself. But gluttonous, in this case, really comes from the sense of food. And it's not here about wanting a lot of food, <laughs> okay? So uh, the gluttonous just doesn't work here because of the context. It's not about a mentality of wanting a lot of things, but rather wanting a lot of food, okay? So in this case, it doesn't work. Obdurate means very stern, stubborn, adamant, unyielding, inflexible. But the word compliant is exactly the opposite, because you're going to comply with, you're going to give in to. So we can see in letters C and D, we have words that are out. In D, almost everything's wrong. C, righteous is wrong. But A and B have all the words that go together. And let us remember that when it says, by which of the following, it does not say by which one of the following. It says by which of the following, which means any of the options can be correct. So here, options A and B are correct. Options C and D are incorrect because at least one word is wrong in the group. Okay? So remember, you can have more than one right answer in vocabulary. All right. Number four. Now we go into the second text. Uh, I just want to, I like to keep my computer here so I can see my reference points. Grim, ghastly, and shaky. Right? So if it's grim, uh, dismal, bleak, ominous, something very horrible, something very dark, uh, without hope. Amiable is very friendly. So there's nothing that can be amiable in a grim situation. Okay? Ghastly influenza, well, the influenza epidemic killed many, many people. So you can see it almost comes from the sense of ghost, but very horrible, appalling, gruesome, horrific, but not ill. If you say ill influenza, ill just means sick. You could say things like ill-fated, right? Or society is ill, which means that it's, it's falling apart. But when we're talking about influenza, it's actually an illness. And so we needed an adverb or rather an adjective, excuse me, that would modify a horrible epidemic. And ill is not a modification for horrible epidemic. It just means something that is not functioning well. It's ill. So therefore, ill in this context does not work. And shaky, uh, the shaky first moments of peace. 
uh, this idea of unstable, something that does not have control of the situation. So things that are rickety, unsound, wobbly, things that, that uh, don't have stability. Quivering, although it seems to be like wobbling, it means shivering. It means like very, it, think of it as being very, very cold and quivering, sometimes from fear. It's a shaking, but in a physical sense, not in the sense of a, a nation. It's the fear of what's going to happen. When shaky actually means something unstable, something that's not under full control. Okay, so therefore, in this case, only letter B is correct. So in the previous one, you can have more than one, but not necessarily. You have to look at each one separately. So sometimes you can have two rights, sometimes you can have three rights, sometimes you can have none rights, etc. Okay, so always make sure that you pay attention to each option separately so that you answer true, false according to the option and not just a multiple choice. This one's right, so the rest are wrong. Don't do that because you'll get into big trouble. Okay. Number five, some more great vocabulary here. Now working a little bit more with expressions. Something that's in tatters, when it says the Austro-Hungarian empires, or the Russian and Austro-Hungarian hung empires, in tatters, in ruins, destroyed, right? Now, the problem is we put in the word shattering in an ing form. Now, here I purposefully put this in in a wrong form. It should be shattered. It should say Russian and Austrian, Austro-Hungarian empires shattered. It would be an ED form. Shattering is the action of destroying. And so here it's a grammatical error. And if you look at the, the command, it says according to the semantic and grammatical uses, usage in the above context, determine the following statements are correct. And we also have the words replace in each of these. So you had to look at the grammar. The idea of shatter and in tatters is similar, but because of the grammatical structure, it's wrong. Okay, so pay attention to the commands. The expression will, determination, and persistence. This will is not a future tense. It means your, your, your strong desire to do something. This is the perfect translation for vontade, right? A sua vontade. So resolve, although resolve many times you think is like to resolve a problem, right? Actually, your resolve is the same thing as your strong desire to do something. So those are two words that I bet a lot of people got mixed up on, right? So will is the same as resolve. Determination is the same as grit, your, your, your um, never give up, never say die kind of attitude. And persistence and perseverance constantly... Uh, 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 fighting for what you believe in, okay? So yes, these three words can be substituted both semantically and grammatically. For want of leadership, uh, for want, a want is a desire for. And if you say for want of means because of the lack of, right? So for want of such leadership, among other things, the promise blah, 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 didn't happen, okay? So when we say for want of leadership, uh, could be replaced by due to the longing of such supremacy. It's actually not even longing of, and that, that wasn't in, uh, intentional. I just really should say longing for. You long for something, not long of something. But anyway, uh, longing for such supremacy. Uh, when you say here, let me read the paragraph to you. Leaders need to negotiate as well as to inspire, to be capable of seeing past short-term political gains, and to balance the interests of their nations against those of the international community. For want of such leadership, among other things, the promise of 1919 soon turned into the disillusionment, division, and aggression of the 1930s. So what happens? When we say for want of, it means lack of, right? We want this kind of leadership, but it's not there. So when you say for want of, we actually mean a lack of, okay? And it's not a longing for, it's not a desire for, right? Because want, you might think of desire and longing. That's not the objective here. It's actually the lack of, because of, due to, the lack of leadership, not supremacy. So this leadership here was actually the idea of the leaders that would come to combat the fascist leaders, not the supremacy itself, which was the fascist leaders. You see what I'm saying? So the word want and longing do not substitute, and here the word leadership and supremacy do not substitute. Okay? So the whole expression is incorrect. And the last one, the expression foreordained could be replaced by kismet. Actually, kismet means doom. It's used in a noun form. So in the first case, it's grammatically incorrect. Foreordained actually is a verb, and it means to predict, to forecast. To ordain means to 
determine something to be true. To foreordain means to predict something. Okay, so foreordain, forecast, predict all mean the same thing. Kismet is also a prediction, but a prediction of doom, of, of uh, ominous events, something bad that's going to happen in the future. So two things happen. One, if Kismet is only talking about something bad, uh, but, you know, foreordained here was also talking about something bad, so that wouldn't be such a big deal. But kismet is in a noun form, not a verb form. Therefore, it's grammatically incorrect and uh, is incorrect in this case. Okay? Got the idea? So be careful of your grammar. Question six. In the command, again, we have determined if the following statements are true or false. That doesn't give us any information. We look at the main verbs in the, the answer. We see flourishing, we see plunged, we see triggered, we see are once again, blah, blah, blah. So we know it's a directly stated information text. Wilson fought for a more just and flourishing world order to compensate the suffering incurred in World War I. Yes, the Wilson's League of Nations was meant to create an international community of democratic nations by providing collective security for one another. So, to, uh, um, what do I want to say? They, they, they work together for a betterment of the whole, right? A more just and flourishing. Just in a sense of justice, flourishing in a sense of prosperity. Right? So collective security for one another, they would not only end aggression, but build a fairer and more prosperous world. So just fairer, flourishing, more prosperous. Right? And then uh, fight against the ills that they suffered in World War I, which is a providing collective security for one another. So yes, this is true. By the way, Woodrow Wilson was one of my, my favorite ex-presidents. I think he's one that was most misunderstood in his time. He was trying to put together a United Nations kind of idea, uh, and the world was behind him in the sense of the League of Nations, but when he brought it back to the American government, the United States Congress shot it down. Uh, and then, you know, no, we will not be, uh, the whole multilateral principle that he had in his mind in the early uh, 20th century was something that the world wasn't ready for. And unfortunately, it all fell back into World War II 20 years later, right? Uh, but anyway, okay, just a personal commentary there. The strong desire for a better world plunged into disenchantment, rifts, and bellicosity, thus leading to the beginning of World War II. So when we talk about disenchantment, disillusionment. Rifts, division. Bellicosity, aggression. So it's a pure vocabulary term. So this is what I'm asking. When you have a directly stated question and you see it's just terms that are being substituted, all I'm really doing is rewriting the sentence in a different way. Okay? So I've taken the same sentence where it says the want for leadership uh, for a better world. We can infer this really because it says for want of such leadership. In other words, the strong desire for a better world. Not for Hitler and Mussolini, but we, we lacked it. We wanted something that was better leadership. Okay? And then it plunged into these three main things in the 1930s, the beginning of World War II. So it, you have to just uh, take an almost lexical chunk approach where you're taking a piece, and from that piece you can interpret this means this, this means that. Okay. Now, disenchantment, rifts, and bellicosity are the direct substitution of disillusionment, division, and aggression. But the idea of the strong desire for a better world is what we understand for, from, for want of such leadership. Because we want this leadership to combat Hitler and, and Mussolini, so we want a better world. You see what I'm saying? So it's something that can be extrapolated from the text that is not specifically stated. Yeah, extrapolate may be a bad word. Maybe infer or implied from the text. Okay? All right. Uh, letter C. Populism and sentiments of vengeance on the part of Mussolini and Hitler triggered the onset of the horrors of World War II. Actually, the... It wasn't Mussolini and Hitler who were uh, trying to gain revenge. It says, although some of the decisions made upon ending the war in 1919 certainly fueled populist demagoguery and inspired dreams of revenge, the calamity of World War II owed as much to the failure of the democracy's leaders in the interwar decades to deal with rule-breaking dictators such as Mussolini, Hitler, and the Japanese militarists. So what we're seeing here is... You have two different things. You have populism and vengeance, and you have the inability to deal with these new dictators, Mussolini, Hitler, and Japan. 
So one thing is not a direct relation to the other. So when you say populism sentiments of vengeance on the part of, so what you're saying is Mussolini and Hitler were the populists and the ones fighting for vengeance. And it's not. These are two principles that, were, that led to World War II, and Mussolini and Hitler were principles. They're not one upon the other. Okay? So that's what we commonly do as writers. We take, or these reviewers, we, uh, we take one piece of a text and we take another piece of a text and we join them together as if they were cause and result. When actually they're just two separate ideas that don't have a direct link one to the other. Okay? Thing to be paying attention to. So this one is false. <clears throat> and letter D, race supremacy, the decay of the multilateral world, and malicious bigotry are once again arising in a similar manner as during the onset of World War II. The first thing I want you to pay attention to is the word a similar manner. Not exactly the same, but similar to. We can see similarities in the people who are running the world today and the people who were running the world then. Please recognize there's also that, that article I gave last class, I think. Popul yeah, populism is not fascism, but it could be a harbinger. That's a, it's an interesting one. There's, one. there's one full foreign affairs back in 2016 just on populism. And it was very interesting of those comparisons between who's populist and who's not, what, what is a fascist and whatever. You know? so, and I think even that one from Stalin and, and, uh, and Hitler comes from that populism uh, magazine. So it's a, it's a good one to go back and re research. Uh, July, I think it was, 2016. And they had a number of articles about what is populism, what is fascism. It's an interesting, interesting uh, look. So anyway, what we see here is a similar manner, not exactly the same. And then we have a lot of simple uh, substitution here. So we see a century later, similar forces of ethnic nationalism, which would be the race supremacy, eroding international norms and cooperation, decay of the multilateral world, and vindictive chauvinism, malicious bigotry. So all I did was create synonyms for each of those expressions. And then... Uh, and authoritarian leaders willing to use them are again appearing. So we see rising in a similar manner as during the onset of World War II, the beginning of World War II. Okay? So we're referring to uh, how these leaders of today are similar to the leaders of World War II. That's one reason why I think studying World War II for this next examination may be very interesting. Even though we, the Treaty of Versailles is very important because we're exactly 100 years on, and uh, analyzing World War II and what happened between 1919 and 1939, those 20 years of, of uh, decay of the world society and falling back into war can be very interesting because it seems like we're going through a very similar time. And that's the question that a lot of the CESPI examinations do or make is that they want you to contemplate, are we following a similar historical uh, flaw, uh, trap, or, or not, you know, so we need to learn from our past in order not to repeat our ills of society, okay? All right, now we come to the third text now, which is the idea of, what was the title? The Committee to Save the World Order, right? So now we need to contemplate uh, what does the world need to do to combat China and Russia, to combat Donald Trump to a certain extent and to maintain the, uh, to create what they call the G9, which is very interesting, uh, which is uh, to counterbalance Trump's uh, aggressive and authoritarian uh, instincts, right, so that they can bring the world back to a, a more multilateral uh, structure. That's what I believe in, and I like the article, but uh, not everyone believes the same thing. Let's start with some vocabulary here. Embrace, dashed, and jettisoned can be replaced respectively, so in the same order, by which of the following options can be more than one answer, but here only one answer. So when we look vertically, embrace is the idea of uh, welcoming, adopting, even clinch to an extent in the sense of really accepting, right? grasping, taking hold of. But a hug is just a physical sentiment right, of affection. And so we don't use hug in the same metaphorical form. Dashed, uh, let's see, I just want to see, uh, traditional foreign policy have been dashed. So that means frustrated, thwarted, foiled. They've, been, they've had barriers that, that have been constructed to destroy the actual 
traditional foreign policy. See what I'm saying? So we have to have the idea of destruction. Scurried is a secondary definition of dash, which means to move very quickly. Okay? So if it were like the, the rabbit dashed across the field, then he scurried across the field. Okay? So move very quickly would be a different definition, and it does not fit this context. And jettisoned, uh, as Trump has jettisoned old ways of doing business, which means to get rid of. It doesn't come from the sense of jet, like, you know, take off or something like that. It means actually to destroy. Okay? So discarded, ditched. I love that word, to ditch something. It means like you throw it out the window into the ditch. It's kind of a horrible image, but it's the idea. So you discard, you ditched, or you abandon something. But the clutch is actually to, to take hold of. It would be more like embrace than like jettison. Okay? So here, since we have hug, scurried, and clutch that are wrong, only letter C is the option where all three are correct. Right? And number eight... Determine if the following statements are true or false. Nothing there. We see that all of the verbs here are active verbs. We don't have any suggestion ones, so we're still working with directly stated information. So can we find this information in the text? The BRIC nations, and I did put BRIC and not BRICS because in the, in the article they were not talking about South Africa. So I only put BRIC nations. So it's Brazil, India, China, and Russia. The BRIC nations seek to remodel global regulations and take on a new role of international accountabilities. Now, all the way up through international, it was okay. But the, when you got into the word accountabilities, it says uh, emerging powers such as Brazil and India embrace the perks of great power status, but shun the responsibilities that come with it. Shun. They push away. They refuse to take on. Okay, so uh, the, the idea of responsibility is something that Brazil and India are not willing to take on, right? So the sense that we can't say all BRIC nations. China and Russia are willing to, but Brazil and India are not. So therefore, it is false. Uh, letter B, U.S. President Donald Trump has emerged as an authoritarian figure that seeks to undermine traditional American foreign policy of freedom and democracy. Yes. <laughs> I mean, if you just give me that sentence, I would have said yes, that's true. And even according to the article, it's also true. The newest culprit, however, is a surprise, the United States, the very country that championed the order's creation. This is the funny part about it. It's a, quite ironic. The people who created the organization are the ones trying to destroy the, the organization now. Seventy years after U.S. President Harry Truman sketched the blueprint for a rules-based international order to prevent the dog-eat-dog -dog geopolitical competition that triggered World War II, U.S. presidential Donald Trump has upended it. He has discarded it. He's overthrown it, undermined it. He has raised doubts about Washington's security commitments to its allies, challenged the fundamentals of global trading regime, abandoned the promotion of freedom and democracy as defining features of U.S. foreign policy, and abdicated global leadership. That's scary, isn't it? That's, it's, power, it's heavy, and they are heavily criticizing Donald Trump in this in this article. So U.S. President Donald Trump has emerged as an authoritarian figure that seeks to undermine traditional American foreign policy of freedom and democracy. Now, there's other things that we talk about, but here we're talking about abandon the promotion of freedom and democracy as defining features of U.N. foreign policy, right? U.S. foreign policy, sorry. Although there are other points that are also important, we're not asking you to say this is everything that he's done. This is one of the things that he's He's emerged as this authoritarian figure, and he seeks to do this, among other things. So as long as it's one thing that he seeks to do, there's no problem. There's no, no obligation to have to name all of them. Okay? So of the four things that they named, one, two, three, four things that he's doing, one of them is here, and so it is true. Okay? Letter C, the newly constructed alliance called the G9, which I think is very interesting in this article, in order to maintain Truman's rules-based international order. That's true up to there, but then it says, must hinder President Trump's authoritarian moves and build a framework of multilateral diplomacy. Actually, it says, should have two imperatives. Maintain the rule-based rules -based order in the hope that Trump's successor will reclaim Washington's global leadership role and lay the groundwork. So... It's not that they need to impede Donald Trump. They need to maintain the rules-based order, hoping that in the next election, Trump will be pushed out of power, God willing, and uh, then the next successor will then come back to a global leadership role. That's the idea. So here, what I put in my answer, it says they have to, they have to hinder President Trump's authoritarian moves. They're not fighting against Trump. They're trying to think about the next 
president and not Donald Trump, right? And the building of the framework will be done by the next president, not by them, not by the G9, okay? So it, it's false according to this text. And the last one, economic and military collaborations with the G9 alliance are imperative to counterbalance Trump's, Trump's abandonment of democracy, freedom, and human rights worldwide. Now, this one is true because here we're talking about the economic and military collaborations within the G9 are imperative to counterbalance. So economic cooperation is a good place to start, and G9 members are already creating alternatives to the trade deals Trump is abandoning. Okay, so right there you have the idea of abandonment. But they will have to go further, right? Uh, increasing military cooperation, defense spending, and using a variety of tools at their disposal to take over the U.S. role as the defender and promoter of democracy, freedom, and human rights across the globe. So the last question was about uh, do they need to directly counter Trump? No, they're, they're actually looking for the next successor. But if they really want to take over, then they need to begin to counter. That's the idea, okay? So they need to counterbalance the abandonment, all right? That's the idea. They, had to, they need to represent a space that Trump has left behind, that kind of G0 world, okay? Very good. So a little bit tricky in that last part because the, the C, we're not directly focusing on Trump, but we are trying to fill the gap that Trump is leaving. That's the idea in letter D. See what I'm saying? So it's not a question of combating Trump. It's a question of taking over the gaps that Trump leaves behind. That's the idea. Okay, very good, very good. So you got some history from World War I. You got some history from World War II. You got some ideas of what we need to do now. I thought that was a good evolution of thinking about the 20th century. Where are we today? And what do we need to do to move forward, right? I, I'm in favor of what they put forth in this idea of, I forgot the name of the article, the Committee to Save the World Order because I'm very much uh, uh, in favor of multilateralism, uh, globalism, uh, uh, but I think there are a lot of people who are much more in favor of isolationism for, for your own reasons. And I'm not trying to say you're wrong, but I think that uh, the multilateral and pluralism of the world is the future and not the isolationism, personal opinion. All right, so there you have it. Uh, a few uh, good texts for you to read. I want you to go back now and and go and read those three texts. They will be very good background information for you for all of the examination. All right? That's all I have for you today. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you next time. Take care.